person who I thought would be the ultimate capstone for this deadly serious conference is someone who I've been following for a very long time. Um, strange death of Europe about how Europe has voluntarily surrendered, committed suicide, cultural suicide, essentially through immigration practices. But th and that was stupendous, but then uh, madness of crowds, I just thought, rock just changed my view of the world in such a way it put all the lunacy that we see, literally madness of crowds, in a context that started to make sense. And one of the phrases that he used that I wind up using all the time is that a lot of the things that they're doing with trans in particular, but other things as well, with COVID, masking, and it's deliberate derangement of us. It's not just forcing us into compliance, it's forcing us to do things or say things or believe things knowing they made no sense. And we're seeing this, he had written about this a few years ago, but it's gotten crazily worse, right? And not only are we supposed to, but it's become illegal to mispronoun people or to dead, just, this is, it's not just because it's their agenda, it's not just because of trans, it's not just to be fair, whatever. It's literally to derange us. And when we still see people walking around wearing masks, that's been a pretty successful derangement also. So madness of crowds I thought was just amazing. And then the new one, War on the West, that it, it makes you cry. I don't know that I, I, I don't think I told Douglas Murray this, but I do a lot of books on tape and it, it's only happened twice that I have to pull over because of something so emotional. Once was in the opening of Madness of Crowds where he quotes, I don't remember who you quote the first one, but it's a brilliant, a brilliant quote from some great philosopher. And then the second one is Kylie Minaj or, or Nicki Minaj. Um, just, um, I, what, what was it? It was, it was, it was like, something about my, my butt, my butt, my butt, my butt, my butt, my butt. And, and, and he reads the book himself. And so this brilliant erudite quote followed by my butt, my butt, my butt. And I, I, I literally had to pull over. I was crying, I was crying. And in the, in, it, when, when life gets me down, that's one of those go-to things for me that just pulls me right out of it and I just start howling. Um, absolutely brilliant. And the other, the other time I've had to pull over is from War on the West a number of times because it is a war on the West and how he describes it is so poignant and magnificent and excruciating and it's not just war, it's, it's, it's war on that specifically which makes us great. And so you feel at the same time that it's war, but, at the, at, but also what makes us great. And that's why I wanted him to speak tonight, because we're talking about World War III and all that we're losing, but he also talks about why it's crucial that we defend the West. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming. <laughs> I can't believe it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen, for that really warm um, introduction. It, it's very touching. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I should actually say to be back uh, at the American Freedom Alliance. I, I think I was pretty much here at the start. I'm trying to think back, but I was asking somebody earlier, Pepperdine? about 15 years ago, am I right, Aubrey? Um, and uh, I've observed your work in all the years since and admired it and always am amazed that there is a sanctuary of um, sense in this state. And it sort of seems, it seems amazing to me. Um, but I, I admire so much what you've been able to achieve and your resilience in the face of that. And also the amazing um, 
depth and breadth of what is being addressed in this conference today and tomorrow. It's quite a schedule that you have. Um, I have to say, um, I'm, I'm always put, put in mind whenever apocalyptic scenarios emerge of the fact that there's always a risk that, that there's an apocalyptic scenario you just didn't see coming and hadn't thought of. And it always puts me in mind the moment at the beginning of the COVID epidemic, I was I got a call from a friend who's in national security in the UK. And at that point, you know, we're all in our houses and we're waiting. And my friend called me, his, his expertise is cyber and other things. And he said, he said, what are your thoughts? And I said, about what? He said, this pandemic. And I sort of said, well, I, I don't need pandemics never be my thing. And he said, I'm very annoyed. And, <laughs> and I said, well, sure, I mean, we can't leave our houses, but on top of that, why are you annoyed? He said, I always hated the pandemics experts. I always hated them. And I would always like skip their sessions at conferences. <laughs> and now they're going to be everywhere. <laughs> We're going to have to listen to them. It's just very annoying. <laughs> I thought it was a pretty unique insight on it, but I sort of knew, I knew what he meant. I was like, oh gosh, they've got their day. And, you know. um, anyhow, um, I actually think of the number of threats that I've written about in my um, in my career to date and uh, have covered quite a lot. Um, Karen was kind enough to mention my book on immigration and Islam in Europe, The Strange Death of Europe, that came out, I think, in 2017. <coughs> um, the Madness of Crowds was, was, was an attempt to... Um, well, I, I said to my publisher, I said, I've, I've jumped on maybe the biggest taboo in Europe, which is immigration, and I'm still here. And, um, and he said, well, so what do you want to do next? I said, I want to find every other taboo and jump all over them as well. <laughs> and, um, and it was great fun because when the, when the book came out, um, one of the first events I did was at my old university at Oxford. And there was a graduate student who was interviewing me and there was this packed auditorium. There were, you know, kids sitting on the stairs and everything. And, um, and very sort of expectation in the room. And my uh, interviewer said, uh, so Mr. Murray, um, I'd like to start by just reading the contents page of your new book. <laughs> and it was gay, women, race, trans. And he looked at me and I looked at him and I looked at the audience and smiled and we all burst out laughing. Um, because it was just that feeling of, yes, these are all these things these young people want to talk about and they're all told you can't talk about them or that the parameters are incredibly narrow and so on. And they don't, smart young people know that's not the case. Smart young people want to have ideas out. They want to have the freedom to discuss. Yes. So anyway, um, as I said, I, I said then that um, uh, the analogy I ended up on for that was that, in fact, I was describing the, that book as I was writing it to a friend of mine who's in the army in the UK, and he said, we have a device that does exactly the thing I think you're trying to do, Douglas. And I said, oh, this is very interesting. And the American army has it as well, and it's a, um, a, um, a rocket that can be fired across a minefield, and it has a, a, um, a long explosive lead behind it, and it lays it down across the minefield and then detonates. And I said, yes, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> and I really got quite interested in this weapon system because the point of it is, is that this particular uh, demining thing, it can't clear the entire minefield. What it can do is make it safe for an, a vehicle to cross the minefield, yes. for a convoy eventually to cross the minefield, for people to start walking across the minefield. And I said, well, I, whatever that device is, I'm like the cheaper literary version of it. And, um, uh, and, and actually, I sort of do think in, the, in a way that's one of my self-appointed tasks is to say things that a lot of other people think but often can't say. It's one of the sad phenomena of the modern West that there are all of these things we all know, but we're not meant to say. There are all these things we all know are not true, which we are expected to say. And that's where part of the derangement comes from. But... The book I m most recently wrote, which Karen referred to, The War in the West, was a sort of culmination of what I've been thinking about in recent years, which was um, what it was that was going on even underneath these things. Why, why? I mean, the question I always had about immigration was why, not why people are coming, 
I mean, I, for the strange stuff of Europe, I was in, my, in, my, in migrant camps across North Africa and the Middle East and across Southern Mediterranean Europe. And I never thought, why are people coming? I mean, that was obvious. <laughs> You know, it's very obvious. I mean, if you're a young Tunisian man, or you've not got any hope, you've not got any prospects in your life, your government doesn't do anything for you. Yeah, it makes sense to try to cross the Mediterranean. I, I never, I never thought that was an interesting question. The interesting question I always thought was, why do we allow this? Um, and that was really the question underneath the strange death of you. It was why would we do this to ourselves? Um, and the Madness of Crowds also addressed some of that with some of the social issues that have been deranging people in recent years. But, but the war on the West is really the, the, the thing underneath all of those questions, which is, again, why we do this to ourselves. Everybody here who's a student of history knows the famous Toynbee quote that civilizations don't die by murder, they die by suicide. Um, it's the... It's the the odd suicidalism of the West, in fact, the self-hatred in particular in the West that really has been the single thing that I've found most striking throughout my own adult life. Let me give you an example. Uh, I was only born in 1979, but I was born in a culture which revered heroism. That was the principal thing that we admired, was heroism. Um, there are follow-ons from that. We admired stoicism. Um, one of the phrases, uh, Mimi Perlman knows this, that one of the, one of the phrases what one grew up with in England was mustn't grumble. I can't think when I last heard someone say that. <laughs> now it's just grumble away. <laughs> Get a Netflix series <laughs> and pull up a chair. Uh, but we, 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 we were brought up with the idea that the world has miseries. People have their own private tragedies. Don't add to them unnecessarily try to improve their day and go about your own day in a, as good a fashion as you can and bear things and, and cope with suffering and much more. And that has entirely changed in my own lifetime, which, as I say, doesn't feel that long so far, but it's entirely changed. And the system has moved from an admiration of heroism, of courage, into an admiration of victimhood, where, bizarrely, People want to have a positive Olympics of victimhood. Uh, I noticed this starting some years ago. You could tell it when somebody in an audience, not an audience as intelligent and sensible as this one, but other audiences, you would have when people just put up their hand and they start say, speaking as. Uh -huh. uh, I say, uh, if somebody says speaking as, you know, everything that comes after it is going to be rubbish. <laughs> Speaking as an indigenous woman of, I don't care. It doesn't affect the quality of your question. The quality of the question is in the question. That's it. Everything else is irrelevant. But that's not the case anymore. Everything is about the the con the, the person's characteristics. Nothing to do with the content of the character. All just to do with the characteristics. And this, of course, in modern America, in particular, in corporate America, everywhere is the great disease that has rotted through. You have the DEI or DIE uh, uh, problem, where every single corporation in America, I mean, I used to think, well, this will all stop, this insanity will stop in the universities, for instance. You know, there were, there were, there were, two, there were two jokes that, that conservatives like me used to tell that, that ended up the joke being on us. Um, one of them was, oh, well, all of these kids are going to rack up debt in their, you know, BA in lesbian dance theory at Berkeley, and they're going to go out into the world and that's going to wake them up. When they get out of there in the marketplace, they're going to, no, no, the joke was on us. There were masses of jobs for these people. They all went into HR. They made everyone else have to agree with them. Um, now you have the phenomenon of, of, of the bosses being terrified of the junior employee. I always say I want to make a verb to Reagan Airport worker people. I always say to bosses in, in publishing houses whenever I'm told that there's a, you know, the junior staff don't like a book, I say Reagan Airport worker, the lot of them. Get, get them out, sack them. D d say, that's great, you've got two hours and we're going to advertise your, your job for somebody who's smart and intelligent and realizes that the real world isn't the same as a kindergarten. But 
But the joke was on us. The joke was on us. These people ended up going out into the world and, and finding plenty of work. And the other joke that ended up being on us was the presumption that this would sort of stop at the borders of the humanities, that it wouldn't, for instance, trickle into STEM. And that, I was speaking to somebody earlier who's an engineer by training, that, as you know, is, is also has proved not to be the case. In the War on the West, they give examples of what is, for instance, called equitable math. Equitable math, you will be unsurprised to hear, is um, absolutely unclear what it is, in fact. <laughs> um, all it knows is that math is a white Western construct, which, by the way, is not true. As you all know, if you want to trace the roots of numbers and everything, you've got to go through ancient Mesopotamia. It's, it's, it's a proper United Nations. You know, there's no need to racialize math. But, of course there is, because we need to racialize everything. So we get equitable math. We get the extraordinary sight of, for instance, America's nuclear scientists being sent on a white man struggle session for a week. I detail it in the book. It's quite extraordinary. And you sort of think, I would hope that, like, the nuclear industry in America, that that wouldn't go mad. Like, that would be a bad one to go mad. Um, I can cope if it's the humanities at Berkeley. I, I find it more challenging if it's some nuclear physicists who are also doing this. But yes, that sort of thing. Now, what I noticed in Europe, what I wrote about in Europe, I now live in America. I'm the only person who moved to New York in 2021. Um, it's a sort of article of faith right there. Um, although my, my wiser friends say it's like disaster tourism, isn't it, Douglas? Um, but, but the thing I noticed in Europe was that, that, that really what we were talking about on all of these questions was, it was just a simple answer. It was just a massive loss of civilization, civilizational self-confidence. Just a massive loss. And, you know, if you think about it, it's not very hard to work out why that happened. It happened because twice in a century Europe almost destroyed itself and the whole world. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a lot to carry on your back, you know. And it's understandable that, for instance, a young German in uh, Europe's biggest, most important economy is laden down with doubt. The 20th century in Europe remains behind crime scene tape, effectively. Um, all of its history, it's why we're so interested in it. We're still trying to work out what happened. All of the history, all of the philosophy. I mean, that's, that, that's a big one to lose, to be very, very suspicious of. We, we don't know how the ideas went so bad. So maybe ideas themselves are bad. Maybe we've just got to keep away from ideas. Maybe we've got to have bland managerialism. You know. The culture, the whole culture, also has this crime scene feel. What, how did this happen here? How did this happen in the, the most civilized, advanced cultures in the world? So Europe ha has very understandably lost its civilizational self-confidence. I, like I would like it to get some of it back, but this may not be within the gift of one generation, certainly not within the gift of one person. But what disturbed me more in recent years was something similar going on in America. And this really has struck me quite hard. I first started coming to this country in the 1990s. So again, it's happened in my own lifetime that the American story has completely changed just in my adult lifetime. The late uh, British author and journalist Paul Johnson just died recently, and I was rereading his um, best-selling book, uh, A History of the American Peoples. And the opening line of that book, is, I think I'm gonna get this right, is the history of the American peoples is the greatest history in all of human history. <laughs> This book was written in 1999, and it was a bestseller. It is implausible to even imagine that that would be the opening sentence of A History of America published today. It wouldn't be allowed. The sensitivity reader at the publishing house would say, no, 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 this has to be heavily caveated. Um, but then you look at what has actually been done to every aspect of this country, and you see that this is a very determined effort to completely rewrite the history of this country. Um, 
I did a set of interviews recently with with leading historians in America, Gene Yarbrough on uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Alan Gelzer on Washington and others, all of them, just amazing, amazing figures. It was my great uh, honor to interview. And just trying to get right to the stories of, of the great American heroes. And one of the reasons I did this was because I saw this thing that many of you observed in recent years, particularly in the summer of 2020, which was that when it came to attacking American history, no one knew where the brakes were on the thing. You know, everyone seemed so confident at the beginning that it would just be Confederate statues. And in no time, you know, it's Lincoln, it's Jefferson, it's Washington, it's everybody, absolutely everybody. Um, and, you know, I recently was speaking in Richmond, Virginia, and. I um, asked my hosts to take me down Monument Avenue, which is now, I said to them, it's sort of Plinth Avenue. There's no monuments on it. There's, there's, one, monu there's one statue of Arthur Ashe, who was, a, you know, um, like that's allowed to stay up. So the history of Virginia is now Arthur Ashe, which is quite a lot for him to posthumously carry. But there's just no monuments. So it's, um, everything came down. And I've seen that all across the United States in recent years. And it's just absolutely everything from Columbus, rather obviously. I mean, the, the whole way in which Columbus has been rewritten has, as I've quite often joked, it, it's as if it would have been better if Columbus had never found America. It, he sh the, the, best, the best in retrospect is that he should have set out, found America, gone shh, and... <laughs> And gone back to Spain and said nothing of no, 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 no. nothing of any interest. I wouldn't I wouldn't bother going that way again. Nothing to see here. Um, that seems to seems to be the there's now this is an interesting story in itself. The story of Columbus is a story of extraordinary human bravery. It is a story of a man setting out with a few ships, hoping to find China or route to China discovering America, being a bit annoyed at first, because that means he's not going to get paid. On the other hand, he's discovered something quite important. He doesn't know how to get back. He's sailing with the wind behind him into the unknown. People put up statues to him because we recognized in the past that was an admirable and heroic thing to do. And it's only today that people say, well, look at everything that's happened since and, and look at the, what happened with indigenous people. All of this has been put onto Columbus. It's had nothing to do with him. In fact, if you read Columbus's letters, it's quite clear he was pretty ahead of his time. I mean, it's Columbus who says to the king of Spain in a letter, these people we've found, I think they're like us. Now, who knows that in modern America? Almost nobody, I would say. It's just Columbus bad. Um, and it's the same with every single hero. I was, I was interviewing um, a biographer of Theodore Roosevelt. I said, um, uh, what's it like to represent only the third most wanted man on Mount Rushmore? Um, uh, but it, it, it's just absolutely everything. Everybody. I was, I was at, in uh, the University of Virginia at UVA the other week. It was so, so sad to be in this extraordinary institution founded by Mr. Jefferson, to, to see the beauty of this campus and to realize that the, the faculty and students are taught to be shamed about their founder. That, that, and, and you know, I, I asked to see some of the documents and I, one of the documents in particular is one of the, one of the copies of the Declaration of Independence. And I said, you know, it's very interesting seeing it in the flesh. I said, you know what this reminds me of most is, is the, the signatories on the execution warrant of Charles I. And I said, and this was obviously on the mind of the founders when they were signing that document. Now, of course, I mention this because it, it's an ex another example of heroism. The people who signed the execution warrant for Charles I, when Charles II came back, were in trouble. The ones who weren't already dead were made to be dead quite soon. And the ones who were dead were dug up and their corpses were paraded around and all sorts of horrors. Now, this was on the mind of the founders when they were, found, when they were signing the Declaration of Independence. They were signing a treasonous document. And if things had gone the other way, they'd have all been dead. So this, this, this thing is not just a sort of dead document. It's, it's an extraordinary testament to the bravery of these extraordinary men. Um, 
and and yet that isn't the way in which this is put out. I'm forever being told by students when I speak on campuses that, you know, well, Mr. Jefferson had slaves or, or various other things. And I would say, of course, of course, you're quite right. If you'd have been living in the 1780s, you would have the same views you have in 2023. Of course you would. <laughs> Naturally. It's absurd. It's, in fact, it's obscene to make such a, a misjudgment about history. Again, for his day, Jefferson had extraordinarily progressive views. I, one of the books I wrote about in The War in the West, which has become a sort of uh, um, one of the ant, so-called anti-racist movement, actually take away anti and you've got it right, um, a, a book by Ibram X. Kendi called uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist, accuses Thomas Jefferson of being a racist because Ibram X. Kendi says, Mr. Jefferson never made the anti-racist declaration. And I say, well, yeah, because you came up with that declaration in 2019. And it would require a time traveler. If all the things Jefferson was capable of, that wasn't in his gift. Was, of course he didn't make the, the anti-racist declaration. It was absurd. It's like saying he, he didn't have a Ferrari. <laughs> um, and then he says, and then, then Kendi quotes Jefferson in a letter, and it makes, he makes it clear, like a lot of these race huckster scholars, they don't even do their scholarship. He didn't even read the full letter that Jefferson sent to a friend. He says, Mr. Jefferson said that the races were different. I went to look at the letter in question. It's a letter to the Marquis de Shasta in 1812. And Jefferson says something absolutely extraordinary in that letter. He says, in my observation, the native Indians, the Native Americans, says if, you, if they have the same education as a white man, he says, become the same in a generation. And he says, I don't know if this will be the same with, with black Americans, but I, but I wouldn't rule it out. Now that is, that is, for the 1800s, an extraordinarily progressive idea. At that time, I mean, it sounds amazing now, people didn't know whether the races were connected. In fact, it was one of the big debates of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. The, the, um, there was a theory that there, there was no connection between the races, and those people got into all sorts of problems because it meant that God must have made a white Adam and Eve and a black Adam and Eve and a Chinese Adam and Eve. And they, that was confusing, and they got themselves into a lot of, a lot of intellectual mess. But, 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 of course, they just didn't know that actually, of course, the races were all connected. When Jefferson wrote that letter, he didn't know. It wasn't going to be settled for decades. So all these things, even these virtues, are now used against America, America's founders and the American project. And I think that's quite astonishing because when you look back to the founding of this country, there was only one other country on earth trying anything even remotely similar, and that was France which, of course, many of the founders had seen firsthand, not least Jefferson. Now, here's the thing. Imagine trying to create a republic, and there's only one other place trying to do it, a non-monarchical system of government, and that one has gone straight to the terror. Imagine what it must have been like. And the founders managed to avoid that. And they actually managed to build this extraordinary country that we're lucky enough to be in. And I would have thought the fact that they didn't hold all of our views on, oh, I don't know, gay marriage or something, doesn't really interest me. I don't want to hold these people to the standards that we have now because it would be as obscene as expecting people 200 years from now to share all of the views we have. We, we will have beliefs now that our successors will think are crazy. I can think of a few. Um, <laughs> but being kindly towards the past is, apart from anything else, also a request to our successors to be kindly to us in turn, to be charitable about ourselves. But to, the idea that the American story has turned into this uncharitable lens that everything must be looked at through this, this lens of, of blame, of dislike, of, of guilt, of inadequacy. It's quite an astonishing thing to happen in one person's lifespan. I sometimes say to uh, um, students, you know, imagine your way back, your, imagine your, uh, yourself back all, all that way to, say, 1999. 
the dawn of the new millennium, you have this thing called the internet has come along. You can share human knowledge to a degree that our species has never been capable of before. You can share learning. You will, in time, be able to speak to somebody on the other side of the globe, and the most, ta the most intelligent person in America can speak to the most intelligent person anywhere else on Earth, and they can, they can learn from each other. They don't have to fly anywhere. They... I think that you would have said, my gosh, is there nothing we could not achieve in this century to come? As it is, fast forward to 2023, in America, we don't know when we were founded. Some people think now that it was in 1619. So the most basic things we knew about the nation are now up for grabs. And Supreme Court justices and most other people in the government of America can't tell you what a woman is. This does not strike me as progress. This suggests to me that we have become radically stupider in the last 20 years. And this should be alarming to us because the, this is effectively, this is effectively like being made to go at the speed of the stupidest kid in the class. And we can't travel at that speed, not in America. We can't travel at that speed. I always say to friends, children, if I want to scare them, I always say, you know, you've got to remember that uh, for every one of you, there's there's five Chinese students who are working three times as hard to get the lifestyle that you think is your birthright. Um, so like, keep that in mind. I mentioned in the war in the West that um, so much of what we've done to ourselves in America is used against us by our adversaries. It, it's, it's, it's obscene. Two years ago at the United Nations, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield, then the new uh, UN ambassador from the US, uh, gave a speech on the UN's International Racism Awareness Day, which is, of course, one of those days at the United Nations where an enormous amount is achieved. Um, and Linda Thomas-Greenfield gave her remarks and said, we, America, are a racist country, and we've been racist from the founding. It's in our DNA. She gave various examples. She talked about George Floyd, she talked about there was a massacre at a spa, and if you remember shortly before that, that actually turned out to have no racial component. But Linda Thomas-Greenfield on the floor of the UN told every other country in the world that this had been just the latest example of the inability of Americans to not just massacre minorities. Well, she gives her speech. Oh, and at the end, she remembered to say, however, there is racism elsewhere in the world as well. And there's the treatment of Rohingya in Myanmar. And there is, of course, the issue of the, um, of the Uyghurs in China. So who's the next person up? But the Chinese ambassador to the UN, who says, America has no right to lecture China because America's representative has come here today and done something unprecedented in the history of the United Nations. She has come here and admitted her nation's guilt. So we will not listen to her. Well, yeah, that, that's, that's what happens. You, if you want to be that masochistic, eventually someday you're going to meet a proper sadist. And then you're going to be in trouble. And that's what on the international stage is happening with America. Everybody knows the weak spots. Everybody knows America's weak spots now. And everybody is able to utilize them. And they do so day in, day out. Now, I wanted to have some time for questions and um, back and forth with you, but um, let me leave you with one thought. It seems very important to me that, it, it, as well as surveying all of the problems that exist in the society at the moment, we also try to th think our way through them. Uh, and one of the ways I put this is, what would we be doing if we weren't doing this? You know, if we weren't being have to, if we weren't being made to do very basic biology lessons all the time, um, if we weren't being deranged by people making asinine claims about our history that are not true and having to rebut them, what would we be doing? And I put it out there because it's quite an important challenge to say, if if the conditions were more optimal, what would be? the project? What would we be busying ourselves with? And, do, you know, the, America still produces the most extraordinary people in the world. Uh, you know, if you ask Elon Musk this, he says, I want us to go and live on Mars. I love this. I, I mean, it's not my dream particularly, but I love 
the idea that there are people in America still with dreams, saying this is just something we should do. We should be able to do this. Um, but, but as I say, it's, it's one thing to clear the minds in front of us, but there's also this question of what would we be doing if the minds weren't there anyway? And there's also a possibility that by talking about all of the problems that exist, we talk ourselves into, as I think Europeans have, a sort of state of despair, uh, which is much to be avoided. Uh, there was a term that was used in the Middle Ages for this called acidi. Acidi was listlessness. A listlessness which was recognized to be very dangerous for an individual, but fatal for a society. Acidi is something I think that, well, Europe fell into it in the Middle Ages. I think Europe's fallen into it now. And America is always on the brink at the moment of it as well. But I come back to this question that I, I as I say, I, I often say to students in America, which is, what would you be doing if you didn't have this stuff in front of you, if people weren't continuously throwing bollards in your way? You know, if you didn't have to do all the diversity nonsense and you just could get on with what you are very good at, what your purpose should be, what, what should give you meaning in your life. And I find it's an important question to ask because very often they haven't been asked it. They're so busy working out their way through the obstacle course that they haven't got their eye on what the point of it all is. And as I say, there's always this possibility that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that, you know, things are bad and we talk about them being bad, but we don't actually focus on what the answers could be. And so I wanted to wrap up these remarks by, by quoting something to you, which is, is something I uh, think about an awful lot. Um, because people, it, it's, in the era we live in, we, we can terrify ourselves into a state of acidity, of listlessness, terrify ourselves into being unproductive. And people say, well, the conditions aren't very good, you know, that this isn't working, I, I can't do this. So I wanted to quote something to you. Um, C.S. Lewis was one of my great heroes. He was at my college in Oxford. And um, in October 1939, he gave a sermon in the university church in Oxford, St. Mary the Virgin. Uh, it's, it's called Learning in Wartime. And I wanted to quote this to you because I think it's, I have it almost by heart, but um, it really is worth committing by heart, but I wanted to make sure I didn't get it wrong. This is what he said in, as I say, the fall of 1939, the University Church. Human life has always been lived on the edge of a precipice. Human culture has always had to exist under the shadow of something infinitely more important than itself. If men, mankind, had postponed the search for knowledge and beauty until they were secure, the search would never have begun. We are mistaken when we compare war with normal life. Life has never been normal. Even those periods which we think most tranquil, like the 19th century, turn out on closer inspection to be full of crises, alarms, difficulties, emergencies. Plausible reasons have never been lacking for putting off all merely cultural activities until some imminent danger has been averted or some crying injustice put right. But humanity long ago chose to neglect those plausible reasons. They wanted knowledge and beauty now, and would not wait for the suitable moment that never comes. Periclean Athens leaves us not only the Parthen, but, of course, the funeral oration. The insects have chosen a different line. They have sought first the material welfare and the security of the hive. And, presumably, they have their reward. But men are different. They propound, they propound mathematical theorems in beleaguered cities, conduct metaphysical arguments in condemned cells, make jokes on scaffolds, discuss the last new poem whilst advancing on the walls of Quebec and comb their hair at Thermopylae. This is not panache. 
It's our nature. Over to you. Um, thank you. Thank you.